everyone, and welcome back to Versus, the show that takes fine entertainment, cakes it in mud, throws it into a pit, and makes it compete for our amusement. It's not just a concept, it's our sacred code. Kind of like how those predator folk are united in their favorite pastime, hunting people for sport. I mean, they also hunt xenomorphs, wolves, sasquatches, anything with a pulse and a healthy thirst for a good fight. And now I really want to see predators take on sasquatches. But them quatches are going to have their hands full, especially if they're dueling against the predators that this century has blessed us with on the big and small screen. It's 2010's predators taking on 2022's prey right here on Versus. Audiences around the globe have been treated to some awesome predator films in the current millennium. You got 2010's Predators, which played in theaters worldwide, and Prey, which snuck up on all of us in 2022, courtesy of Hulu. Yeah, they're so good at hunting, they crawled into the TV right under our noses, and no one knew that movie's happening until like, what, eight minutes before it dropped? That's some impressive stealth, Predator. Sure, I do know that there was The Predator in 2018, and we also got a couple of Alien vs. Predator movies, but this idea was probably best suited for the Dark Horse comics run. What a piece of me? You ugly son of a- And as far as Shane Black's Predator movie, it had its moments, but nothing near as awesome as the two closest competitors to the OG 1987 Schwarzenegger classic, Predator, which still holds up as a tremendous action sci-fi adventure, a fun trivia nugget for Van Damme fans, and the greatest handshake in human history. You son of a b <laughs> These Predators are no pencil pushers, they're warriors hell-bent on taking down the best game this side of the galaxy. In one corner we have Predators, the 2010 classic, in my mind anyway, that stars Adrian Brody, Alice Braga, and a bunch of badass extraterrestrial warriors. In the other corner, it's Prey, starring Amber Midthunder, Dakota Beavers, and a bunch of badass extraterrestrial warriors. Or at least one of them. The word extraterrestrial's a real mouthful, can I just call them ETs? Or did that one irresponsible botanist corner the market on the term ET? Let's call him Rhesus or something. Now, now I like Rhesus, don't get me wrong. I love that he drank a beer right out of the fridge, but that old hiding in the stuffed animals trick, it ain't gonna work on predators. They're vicious, intelligent, and have really cool neon green blood. Here's how we'll determine a winner. Round one, box office. Round two, tomato meter slash audience score. Round three, oh the humanity. Round four, iconic moments. And then we'll do a wild card round that should settle the score once and for all. I know you're yelling at your TV or your phone, streaming device, light bright, however you're enjoying this program, I know what you're gonna say. But Mark, you sexy SOB, how can we have a box office round if one of the movies wasn't released in theaters? I have a workaround for that. Come on, don't you trust me by now? I, Mark Ellis, have been hosting this show since everyone in the original Predator movie was in office. Arnold and Jesse Ventura became governors, and I think Carl Weathers should run for public service in the galaxy far, far away. Mandalorian Season 3, where we vote Apollo Creed, the Chancellor of Tatooine. Ooh, now I want to see Predators fight a bunch of Mandos. That's a pay-per-view match worth shelling out 99 bucks for. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. All right, last thing before we get going here, I love you all, or at least I like you as a friend. I want to hear from you. Leave a comment or hit me up on social media with your take. Do you like Predators or Prey better? One has a resilient doggy, the other has my doppelganger, Topher Grace. It's going to come down to the wire. It's a battle of ugly MFers right here, right now on Versus. Let's get it on. <laughs> Round one, box office. All right, kids, we know that a big-time property like Predator is capable of bringing in Bafo box office, but we have a conundrum here. Prey, the sort of ancestor to Predator, even though director Dan Trachtenberg doesn't like to call it a prequel, was the first movie in the franchise to go direct to a streaming service. No. Bring it home. Which is convenient for us at home, but might hurt its chances to win a round that is all about how much mania generated at the multiplex. But Uncle Mark promised y'all a fair fight, and here we go. Just look at the streaming numbers, and we'll estimate a theatrical run and how that might have done. But before we get there, come take my hand, dear viewer, as we stroll down memory lane. And be careful, there's a bunch of traps and ETs hiding in the trees. No, not the cute kind. <laughs> Predator opened in the summer of 1987 and would go on to generate and adjust it for inflation $140 million domestically. That's what you call a hit. The follow-up, cleverly titled Predator 2, only notched $60 million despite having some cool moments and taking us inside their spaceship. That's a neat looking trophy. Kind of reminds me of that thing that Sigourney Weaver used to tangle with. Both Alien vs. Predator flicks and The Predator each earned well over $100 million around the globe. Propers to you all. So now let's look at our fierce competitors today. Predators debuted in the summer of 10 and would go on to amass 127 million dollars worldwide. Woo! We killed it! 
Ah! I saw it opening day, probably the first showing, and definitely got that free refill on the large popcorn that you get. Shout out to that kid Jason, who works the concessions at a theater in Corpus Christi, Texas. He went viral for his trademark corn flip routine. You pop off, young squire. Us former movie house employees salute you. And now we hit Prey, which dropped on Hulu in the late summer of 22. And within a couple of months, a normal run for a theater release, it had an estimated 6 million Hulu users give it a whirl. That was a record for a film that debuted on Hulu, and it also set premiere records for Star Plus in Latin America and Disney Star Plus in other territories. See? The whole world really wanted more Predator. So let's take that 6 million people and assume that maybe 4.5 million of those folks would have left their couch, gotten in their car and or chopper, and driven slash flown to a local theater to see it. At an average of, say, 15 bucks a ticket, that would equal almost $70 million. But I'm going to bump that number up to around $90 million simply because I really like this movie a lot. And if it had been in theaters, a bigger marketing campaign likely would have generated more pre-release buzz, as opposed to the favorable word of mouth that did get after the fact. Okay, so Predators still appears to have the high ground Anakin over Prey in a close matchup, but we can't leave this round without telling you what Adrian Brody's highest grossing film of all time is, right? Predators ranks fifth on his resume of B.O., though I'm sure he smells lovely. Sandalwood is my guess. <laughs> Brody's best-selling theatrical film of all time is King Kong from 2005 at $550 million. Ooh, and now I want to see the Predators take their ship to Skull Island. If my fan fiction has anything to say about it, could happen. Predators gets the win in round one and goes up one to nothing. <laughs> round two, tomato meter slash audience score. Critics and audiences have been dealing with these pesky otherworldly hunters since the 1980s, and we've always been revved up to see the next chapter, but after experiencing each new film, did it hold up to that very first one? That's what this round is going to figure out, and living up to Predator is a tall order. No, that wasn't a burn on Jean-Claude Van Damme and his stature that's average for an adult male, but was a wee bit diminutive to be a Predator. You know it's a shame. This used to be such a nice part of town. By the by, 1987's Predator is beloved by both movie reviewers and goers. That Venn diagram does overlap. It's 80% on the tomato meter and 87% on the audience score. So yeah, that bar is set quite high. I'm sure Van Damme could jump up and reach it, do some pull-ups. But now we zero in on our combatants here today. Predators is fresh on the tomato meter at 65%, with a critic consensus that reads, After a string of subpar sequels, this bloody, action-packed reboot takes the Predator franchise back to its testosterone-fueled roots. And boy is that accurate. This 2010 movie was the first to be fresh since the OG. Knock, knock. P2 landed at 31%, AVP hit just 22%, and Requiem thudded down to 12%. But there are some sweet fight scenes in there. That's impressive work for Predators, as it came out just three years after Requiem and brought the franchise all the way back to delicious tasting ketchup. The Predator sunk back down below Fresh to a rotten 34%, with a consensus among critics that claims it has violence and quips to spare, but its chaotically hollow action adds up to another missed opportunity for a franchise increasingly defined by disappointment. Oh. Did all or most of those wacky predators, humans, whoever, die for nothing? Once again, we needed a big turnaround in short order, and four years later, Prey hit the sweet spot. 93% on the tomato meter, that's a team record. Did you, did you want me to give you the critics' consensus? It's right there on RottenTomatoes.com. Super handy, and it reads, This rare action thriller that spikes adrenaline without skipping on character development, Prey is a predator prequel done right. Well, there you have it. That's a big lead for Prey as we head to the audience score side, where Predators will hope, or Prey? <laughs> for a miracle comeback. Oh boy, oh no. Is it, it's rotten with the audience? With you? The people that tuned in? What happened? Did I annoy y'all in the theater with my incessant cheering and popcorn crunching? Look, I chew my corn as quiet as a mouse, as silent as an electric vehicle starting, as dormant as Arnold lying in the mud, waiting to sneak attack an E.T. Predators is 52% rotten with the audience, so I can call it fresh adjacent, but I'm not happy with you. Any of you. Y'all better behave when you saw Prey, and the audience score for that is... Alright, it's 73%. That's fresh, but come on, gang. I know you're at home. Get off your phone. Pay attention to Prey. There's a bear fight for crying out loud. <laughs>
Prey is still gonna take this round easily, and it's not just against Predators, it also defeats every other movie called Prey. So there was a Prey movie in 2021, one in 2019, and a 2007 movie called Prey starring Bridget Moynihan. None of them involve Predators, and they're all rotten. Two are at 17%, and one is at 13%, so way to go, Prey. They're the one about the hunt happy ETs. That movie wins round two and gets on the board, tying the ball game at one to one. <laughs> round three, oh the humanity, is what any play by play announcer would exclaim watching the events of either film play out. People do not fare particularly well against predators, even if the films do their best to give us a happy ending. Let's find a way off this planet. Think about it. Maybe a couple of us humans survive if we're lucky, but dozens more meet their maker at the hands of the Ultimate Warrior. That is not a reference to the wrestler, but to be fair, that Ultimate Warrior did win almost 90% of his matches. And most of those scripts were likely better than the one for Alien vs. Predator. I don't mean to knock those movies, but man, what an opportunity we missed. It was nice to see Lance Henriksen again. Thank you. This round will be won by humans, as one gaggle will emerge triumphant and score a point for their film. In Predators, it's a ragtag squad of baddies from all over Earth, collected and dunked into a new setting that feels kind of like a huge, otherworldly paintball course. Except these paint pellets, um, they really hurt. For Prey, we get to experience what it's like to be in a tightly knit indigenous community way back in time, but in the case of Naru, she's looking to prove her worth as a hunter, as most of her male comrades doubt her abilities. But not sorry the Wonder Dog! All oh, right, this round is about the humans, but we have not heard the last from that wonderful pup. What an amazing doggy. Up there with Benji, Old Yeller, Airbud, BB-8, the best of the best movie dogs. <laughs> Dakota Beaver stars as Tabi, who is next in line to lead his people and is the best warrior going in the village. As such, he does see the potential in Sister Naru where others don't. She can hunt, track, but can she come up clutch at the moment of truth? With some help from Sorry She Can. Okay, I, I really love the dog. Also shout out to Dane DeLiegro as the predator in this film. What a workout he went through. According to the six foot nine actor, the head cheeses on Prey wanted a leaner, more athletic, even balletic version of our villain to terrorize the local earthling. He lost 25 pounds, trained in parkour, which is extremely dangerous, never try it, especially if you're as tall as an NBA power forward, but the hard work paid off. His movements echo that of a feral cat, perhaps a panther, and that quickness serves the predator well against Tabby, another skilled hunter in wasabi, and a host of brazen French trappers. To be honest, the French folk helped move the story and it was okay. It was kind of like Nutty Lawrence Fishburne in Predators. Ooh la la. He shows up disguised as one of the baddies, and then we get to visit his palatial estate, which is a crashed ship of some sort. It's a dwelling for sure, but that whole subplot does make the film a wee bit long in the tooth. What sharpens the chompers of Predators is Adrian Brody like we've never seen him before. I knew he was a great actor. He won an Oscar for The Pianist, Splice was cool, but wow, I did not know he had this level of alpha in him. Alice Braga's Isabel is the perfect complement to Brody's Royce. They both might prefer to survive on their own, but as the situation becomes more dire, their skills work hand in hand. I got a good feeling about these two. The other combatants? Eh, their long-term prognosis ain't good. But we had fun while they were there. Danny Trejo, Walton Goggins, two-time Academy Award winner Mahershala Ali. I rewatched this movie last week and did a double take. I was like, hey, the new Blade is in this too. Looking good there, boss. Louis Azawa Changchian is finally suited as Hanzo, Oleg Taktorov is brawny brawler Nikolai, and of course, who could forget? Me. I mean Topher Grace as Edwin. Why is he in this group? The kid from that 70s show and friend of the hit podcast Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong is now one of the fiercest creatures on Earth? Well, watch the movie. Plus, he provides some solid comedic relief without torpedoing the tension. That's a delicate balance, and Topher does it with grace? That is really, really poisonous. What sways me towards predators in this round is the emergence of so many different looks for a predator. We got your scouts, your super predators, their fun falcon companions. Oh, right, I can't count animals in this round. Sorry, spiky warthogs. And we get the berserker predator. They're like Chex Mix. It's all pretty much the same, but different flavors. Try the bold one. That's my favorite. Oh, thank God. I'm so excited that tremendous actors like Amber Midthunder, Dakota Beavers, and Michelle Thrush, as the mother of Naru and Tabi, get some good run in Prey. But Predators puts its cast in a more dynamic setting and gives them more places to stretch their legs and employ their personalities. Plus, Lawrence Fishburne and his weird house. You in my house, mother I'm leaning slightly towards Predators in this round. They all get the point, and the 2010 flick goes up on its younger sibling, two to one. Finally found me, huh, big dog? Round four, iconic moments. 
We love these kind of alien, predator, to a lesser extent, alien versus predator movies for many reasons. They provide us with budding stars, established A-listers, professional wrestlers, and of course, loyal canines. But what we're really buzzing about as we exit the theater or turn the lights back on at our own house are those exceptional sequences so thrilling that they etch themselves in all-time science fiction lore. The scenes that make kids believe they could hold their own with a legendary hunter species like a predator, and the moments that make us adults feel like kids again. Even though these movies are usually rated R, I think I saw the first Predator when I was like five. And look, I turned out okay. If it's memorable parts of a film you like, Predators does not waste any time. It literally starts with badass Adrian Brody falling from the sky as he's waking up, pulling a shoe just in time, and then he meets some other ne'er-do-wells in the same situation, like Danny Trejo, and then he teams up with Alice Braga. Prey also has a formidable punch up top, as the visage of a spaceship matches perfectly with the lore from Naru's people. Both lead characters get tossed into their new life's purpose rather immediately, and the punch helps both flicks find their momentum quickly. What's wonderful about Predators is the title. If you look closely, you see an S at the end of that word, indicating plurality. As in, we got multiple predators, and they come in all sizes. Your medium ones, a large monster known as a berserker, and even Lawrence Fishburne cosplaying as a lethal killing machine so the real ones don't off him. I'm alive. That Morpheus, always one step ahead of the game. The reveal of just what we're up against is always a treat in these films. It's like baking cookies. It sounds easy, but you can actually mess it up real easily. Luckily, both Nimrod Antel and Dan Trachtenberg, their respective directors, Pillsbury doughboyed us some tasty reveals. Naru and Tabi think they're hunting a lion until we see some familiar tracks. And in Predators, Royce, Isabel, and the gang descend upon a campsite that functions as both a nice bachelor pad for Predators, you know, to hang out and get away from their families for a bit, and it's also a good trap for nosy humans. But what we really care about is the full force of our beloved antagonists on display. The fight between Hanzo and a Predator is one of my all-time favorites in franchise history. It's well shot, brutal, and shows a sense of samurai warrior respect between two worthy foes. These Predators respect their adversary, and this latest crop of game they imported from planet Earth lived up to the task. Adrian Brody's Royce ends up tricking his foe and employing every kind of weapon along the way in his quest to survive. It's almost like the humans who grew up playing the game Mousetrap have the best chance of living to see another day when battling a Predator. Lots of traps, trickery, tomfoolery. You ain't winning a street fight against these things. Just ask anyone in Predator 2, which does take place in the streets of Los Angeles, so you gotta get pretty creative. I'm here, kill me. Come on. And it doesn't hurt to borrow some ideas from previous humans who've had success against this warlord species, even if technically Prey does take place hundreds of years before the OG Predator. Both Naru and then centuries later, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Dutch, discover that coating themselves in mud disguises them from the infrared vision that Predators use to hunt. Hey look, every ET has a weakness. Predators can't see in mud, the signs aliens are allergic to water, and ALF couldn't resist cats. <laughs> He's quick. I'll give him that. Do you kids understand ALF references today? It's hard to convey just how huge he was in the late 80s. He was a great show, and he's a first ballot Hollywood Squares Hall of Famer. Anywho, I give the slight edge here to Prey. Both films have some real epic sequences towards their climaxes, and as much as I adore the variety of showdowns in Predators, something about Prey getting back down to muddy basics really tickled my fancy. Naru sets up a wicked awesome bank shot that would make Larry Bird smile. It's kind of like when Happy Gilmore sinks that putt to beat Shooter McGavin, and I'm always down for muddy protagonists. Is that mud or is that quicksand? I can't tell. Either way, it would kill me and sadly Atreyu's horse in the never-ending story. I feel bad I went there. But sorry the loyal dog hero survived this movie, and there was much rejoicing. Prey should feel great about that and this breaking news. It's gonna win round four, earns another point, and ties the match two to two. <laughs> and now it's time for the wild card round, Legacy. I know, I know, you hear the term legacy and you say, Mark, you're so cute, but these two movies aren't old enough to drive a car. How can they have cemented themselves in the pantheon of great sci-fi already? Well, they're on their way to doing that, but here I'm looking at the legacy as it pertains to reviving a primo name brand property that was thought to be moribund until they injected fresh life, innovative new ideas, and blood. Lots of blood, along with some well-timed nostalgia into the mix. Predators arrived a few years after AVP Requiem, and it was clear that the big baddies needed a clean slate. So what better way to erase the chalkboard and start a new semester than on another planet? We're gonna need a new plan. 
But get this, the concept of tossing a gaggle of fearsome individuals into the fray might be the gift that keeps on giving. Every few years, we could have gotten another adventure with a new set of scary folks battling an even more frightening species. You know how everyone can't wait to see who gets cast in the latest murder mystery from Ryan Johnson? People love yelling out names of viable contenders. The Rock, Kiki Palmer, The Muppets. Well, Predators share some DNA as a whodunit simply because these folks are also coming together under mysterious circumstances and are finding out who they can and can't trust. For example, Topher Grace's doctor. Is he really that? Or is there gonna be a twist? And to think, I was rooting for him in the movie Win a Date with Tad Hamilton. Unfortunately, Predators loses some points for not being able to build more upon that premise as the next movie we got featuring the ginormous hunter was The Predator and it was back on Earth. It was a cool team, some fun to be had, nowhere near as awesome as Nimrod Antel's 2010 yarn, a concept dreamt up by Robert Rodriguez in the 1990s as mouthwash for the disappointing Predator 2. All right, so Predators had a lot of potential, hasn't lived up to it yet, hopefully Prey won't fall into the same trap. We took a legendary sci-fi creation and tossed it into a completely different time period. <gasps> we could keep doing that all the live long day. The Predator left something to be desired. We may not have known it would be switching up the age in which the events take place, but now I want a Predator film set in every century. King Arthur and his knights go after one, Cleopatra ordering her Egyptian guards to check out that weird light in the sky, Jesus Christ and his apostles could stumble upon a Predator, and you could even call that movie Prey 2. Is D and I? A wedding fly. Ow! It writes itself. I'm giving you billions of dollars in ideas, Tinseltown. Make good on it. In terms of honoring the foundational Predator film from 1987, both these newer takes delivered in different ways. Predators has the reveal that Isabel is actually familiar with the Guatemala <clears throat> incident and recounts the one survivor, Dutch, AKA Arnold, AKA the guy so traumatized by that mission he became a cop to teach his kindergarten. <laughs> whose debrief detailed the monster that wiped out his team. That was such a cool moment in that movie. And you know, it made all of us lifelong fans feel like we mattered. We paid attention all those years, we give it the thumbs up. But Prey had that mud bathing thing down to a science. It was certainly a familiar nod to Dutch's maneuver, but without feeling reductionist or repetitive. Naro used the elements around her in order to survive. A couple hundred years later, Dutch would learn the same lesson about nature after millions of dollars spent in artillery couldn't pull off the trick. When it comes to medicine and hunting bloodthirsty ETs, sometimes homeopathic remedies are the best. And as much as I adore predators, the hope that Prey gives all of us predator honks is too much to ignore. The 2020 22 film gets the win in the wild card round and thus takes the match. Woo, what a tough battle today. Predators versus Prey. I feel like I had to choose between my own children, except I don't have kids. But if I did, I'd get them started on Predator movies early. And Prey, maybe that'd be the first one I show them. Maybe you go in chronological order according to canon. Did any of you parents do that with Star Wars? You show the little tykes the prequels first, then Solo, then Rogue One, then the classic trilogy, and so forth? Let me know how that goes. And of course, hit me up on social media, at Mark Ellis Live, with your favorite Predator movie ever. Which time period should they visit next? Or should we head back to a new planet with brand new campers? Thank you all for watching Versus. Until next time, I'm your host, Mark Ellis, and I ain't got time to bleed. No, actually, I have a lot of free time.